we take a walk and we're on Champs Elysees, and he had the ring in his pocket <gasps> and got down and proposed. <laughs> whoa, 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 I did not see this happening. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, so that's so why you were okay. extradited that- out of Italy, <laughs> thrust into the hands of Viva La France. You end up after this disastrous 40 years. I mean, did you look and beautiful? Then- did you have a manic career we expecting this? Life can feel like a roller coaster, but in the beauty and the chaos, if you look for it, life is full of love, joy, and kindness. Welcome to the Candace Cameron Bure podcast. We're here to share conversations about life's challenges, celebrations, and everything in between. Season four is When the Going Gets Tough with Bianca Juarez Oltoff. Come join us. Welcome back. I'm excited. We're ready. I am too, because this might be a hard conversation. We're talking about doing hard things. I know. We might need some levity. We might. (laughs) We really jumped into the deep end. We did. Those last two episodes. So I kind of want to, I just want to tell some fun stories today. (laughs) Bianca, you are so full of joy. You are so energetic. You are so wise. I am loving our conversation so, so much. And I, I want to get to know you more and I want our audience to get to know you more. So what is the craziest adventure you've ever had? Okay. So I don't, I wouldn't say I'm adventurous by nature. Like I don't do camping. I don't jump out of airplanes or bungee jump. (laughs) Me either. Okay, good. I knew I liked you. I I knew I liked you. We vibe. We have a very similar energy vibe, but um, (laughs) what I will say is I don't feel like adventure is something that I go looking for. It's almost like it finds me. Mm. So uh, this is almost like a, a vision of what I'll be doing in the future. But when I was 16 years old, I became a lifeguard. And uh, it was the fun. It, I had so much fun being a lifeguard, but I never thought that I would revisit it. I stopped lifeguarding when I was like 21. But a couple of years ago, I was speaking at an event in Fredericksburg, Virginia, and they dropped me off at my hotel and I wanted to pick up a salad before I was going to go to this event. And so I was walking through a parking lot when all of a sudden I saw this blue sedan kind of just like casually cruise into a parked car. And it was, it was the oddest thing. And mm. then people were like yelling and the person inside the blue sedan didn't like, didn't come out and people were gathering around. It was kind of like- Did they pass jer- out or something? Okay. In a very Jerry Springer form, people are yelling at the person inside the car. And I thought of, of like a fight was going to bro- break out. So I walked over there and a guy opened up the door and I walked over thinking that there was going to be a fight. And I wanted to kind of just, you know, right? calm, calm down everyone. And he jumped back. He said, oh my God, that guy's dead. <gasps> And what yeah, exactly? What? I don't know what happened. I literally, I don't know what possessed me, but I start talking to this guy and it was like lifeguard training kicked in. <gasps> no way. ABC, airway, breathing circulation. And so I literally was like checking his pulse, seeing if there was anything in his mouth. I was talking to him. I said, Hey, sir, sir, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? And he didn't move. And a guy comes over. I said, we need to pull this guy out of the car. He said, do you know what, I'm, what you're doing? I literally was like, you're like, I'm a lifeguard. Yes, I do. (laughs) Yes, I do. I was 35 years old and I'm thinking like, move over Hasselhoff. Old top is here now. (laughs) So I grab his legs. He grabs his shoulders. We place him down and I scream, someone call 911. Mm -hmm. And in this moment, Candace, I don't know what possessed me, but I just start going into rescue breathing and CPR. And in the distance, there is like an ambulance waving and like on its way to us. And I hear him, I'm talking to this guy. I said, you can die, but you're not going to die today. You better come back to life. I'm like <laughs> yelling, yelling at, at him. Watch. I am not even kidding you. I'm not even kidding you. And then, so, I mean, the cops came, they put him on a gurney. They're putting all the EKG things on him. The cops take like the situation would happen. And then they released me. I said, is that it? And they're like, yeah, you're free to go. So like, I walked over to like the salad restaurant and I was like, what on earth just happened? <laughs> You and then I called behind. my husband. Yes. And that's what he said. He said, Bianca, you just saved a guy. And so instead of getting a salad, I went to the barbecue next door. Yes, like, I was did. like, oh, no, no, I need barbecue after that. Like <laughs> forget me getting a salad. But I couldn't even eat because I just felt nauseous. Oh, I, I had the yeah. guy's cologne in my hands, Candice. Wow. A long story short, I, I didn't even eat my food. And I walked past the, uh, like through the parking lot again. And I saw the cop and I wanted to see, hey, did the guy make it? Is he okay? Yeah. He was talking to this young man, 26 years old, tall, like six, four. Mm-hmm. And I walked over and the cop's like, oh, that's her. That's who saved your life. <gasps> and in front of me is a 26 year old kid who had a heart attack because he took pre-workout, 
before we worked out and his heart arrested no in the way. car. Listen, Candace, I don't know what came over me, but I was like, brother, you are Lazarus. The Lord has brought you out the grave. Yeah. I'm speaking at church tomorrow and I need you there on the front row because Jesus saved you for a reason. Did he, he go to church? He did. Yes. He came to church wow. with his mom. As he should. Okay. Yeah, as he should. Yeah, I know. Okay. okay. But still. So I, that's, a, that's a gnarly story, but I know sweet Candace, sweet no, Malibu good... Barbie. You look like Malibu Barbie today. <laughs> Candace, you have a story. There has to be some crazy adventure that you can share with our podcast listeners. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to compare to saving a life, <laughs> but when I think of adventure, I think of travel, Yes, which I do my fair share of traveling. And one of my first big trips was with my husband, although we were boyfriend, girlfriend at the time. <laughs> so this is going way back. I was 19. He was 21. And we really liked each other, really, really liked each other. So we decided to take a European vacation Whoa. together. That's serious. That was, it was really serious. Yeah. Little did we know, my husband at the time was still holding a Russian passport. That's where he's from. <laughs> and he was in North America on a work visa to play hockey. So no green card, no U.S. passport. So we booked this whole trip and and we thought we were going to multiple countries and thought everything was fine. And the first country we show up in was Italy. And as soon as we get to passport control, <laughs> they send me through and they were like, send the guards out. Here's a guy with a Russian passport and no visa. So he had gotten a visa, but that country wasn't included on the the visa that it allows, yeah, that it yeah, allows yeah. whatever other countries. <laughs> so it was like the guards came out. Did you see this? Yeah. They, <gasps> no, they started to take him away. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no we're, we're together. We're together. And they're telling me like in Italian, like you go, you go. This isn't your problem. This is his problem. And I'm like, no, we're together. I'm 19 at the time. Oh gosh. And this is the first time I'd ever been out of North America. <laughs> so... So I'm like freaking out at this point and basically like, I'm not leaving him. I'm not leaving him. I'm. Oh, it's a scene. It's a scene. Okay. So they finally are like, okay, crazy teenager, like come along. And they basically stick us in like an airport jail. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. It really, I mean, it wasn't bar cells, but it really was this kind of quarantine ja jail place <laughs> in the airport, which we were in there for about eight hours <gasps> and they questioned us up and down, you know, went through our bags, like took the camera out of my film or took the, sorry, took the film out of my camera and we hadn't even started our adventure yet, but this is how the adventure started. Oh my gosh. And I was freaking. Wait, so you guys weren't able to stay? So we were freaking out. And then finally they come in eight hours later after interrogating us. And then they were like, okay, we're putting him on a plane to France because <gasps> his visa did work for France. And they're like, so you're going on the plane and ma'am, you go wherever you want to go. And I'm like, no, no, we're on this trip together. I need to be on that plane too with him. And they're like, not our problem. So long story short, I basically had a hissy fit and... <laughs> Looking back in retrospect, they were actually quite nice to me because they put me on the plane with Val. So we end up in France. There's even more in between I'm not going to share, but it was kind of the most horrendous 48 hours we'd ever, I've ever experienced in my life. Welcome to Europe. <laughs> and then we got to France. We were so exhausted. We hadn't slept. We end up bickering. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm going home. I'm getting my own, I'm getting a ticket and I'm flying back to the US. This is awful. And then Val called my room a couple hours later. He was in his room and he had just said, can we just go take a walk? And I said, sure. Okay. So we take a walk and we're on Champs-Elysees and he had the ring in his pocket and got down and proposed. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Whoa, I did not see this happening. 
Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. So that's so why you were date. extradited that- out of <laughs> Italy, thrust into the hands of Viva La France. You end up after this disastrous 40 years. I mean, did you look and beautiful? Then- <laughs> did you have a manicure? We were expecting this. I was not expecting it at all. But it it truly was the worst 48 hours that <laughs> became the most beautiful oh, story that and started of the new part of my life and being, yeah, getting married. So, so. his whole plan was to propose to you. That was the purpose of the whole trip. Yeah. Oh, and it just started out disastrous. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's a good story. That is a good story. That's some adventures right there. Yeah. It was an adventure. <laughs> so where are you taking us in today's episode? Because the first episode we talked about failure mm-hmm. and our second episode, we talked about not quitting, yeah. not even allowing it to be an option. And today we're going to talk about doing hard things. Yes. Yeah. So I think that uh, one of the values that I see is kind of like a lost art. I won't say it's missing. It's a lost art. The power of showing up. Mm. I think we grossly underestimate the power of consistency Mm. and um, we love the instant. So with a tap, a touch, a swipe, we can get anything at our doorstep. Don't can, I know it? Literally, we can get, we <laughs> can there's get our, not a package on my doorstep. I'm like, what happened today? <laughs> come on, Amazon, come on. <laughs> so we can get groceries delivered. We can get uh, meals delivered. We can get a hookup delivered. Everything can be at our doorstep. Mm-hmm. So the art of patience, the art of persevering is something that's lost. And for people who just kind of feel like they're at wit's end, they feel like they're tired. They don't want to continue on. I, I want to speak to that person and one affirm the fact that you got up out of bed today. Mm -hmm. is a sign that you're resilient. Mm -hmm. The fact that you showed up at the job that you feel is going to be the end of you, that's an act of resilience. The fact that you are choosing to parent or choosing to remain in your relationship or choosing to show up at your job, that's an act of resilience. And we might not see the benefits now, but I love that we get to pepper in some theology and some biblical history into Mm -hmm. this series. And one of my favorite characters is a man by the name of Noah. Noah, for those that don't know, maybe you didn't go to vacation Bible school or you're not even a person of faith. There is this person in Hebrew history um, who God gave a instruction to, Mm -hmm. to build what we can just consider a boat, a very large boat that was called an ark. Now that's a feat in and of itself, but history tells us that there was no body of water for a hundred miles from where Noah was. Can you imagine getting that calling? No, 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 thank you. I'd like you to build a big (laughs) boat. Sure. What is that God? Right. Exactly. This is the conversation as it went. So God speaks to Noah, says, hey, I need you to build this large boat. It's going to be for the saving of mankind. And so every day Noah wakes up, he chops wood, he saws it, he sands it, he assembles it. And the next day he chops wood, he sands it, he saws it, he assembles it. He wakes up the next day, he chops wood, he sands it, he assembles it. Every Not only does he show up and do it, but people think he's crazy. Exactly, exactly. I mean, let's put ourselves in his shoes. Like there's people that are walking by, looking at you build something that no one's ever built for something that's never existed. This thing called water and a flood. So at first people might be interested. Maybe at year five, they begin to think it's weird. Maybe at year 10, they think you're absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. But after year 20, after year 30, scripture tells us that it took 120 years for him to build this. At, at some point he has to start Whoa. thinking like, this is insanity. Mm-hmm. It's beyond insanity. This is stupidity. I didn't hear God. What, what exactly is this for? And we do the same thing. Mm. Candace, we go to jobs and we say, I didn't hear the voice of God. It shouldn't be this hard. People are making fun of me. People are laughing at me. What's the point? Until one day, drip, drip, mm. drop. And the people who make fun of you, the people who laugh at you, the people who don't understand you Mm -hmm. will begin to cry out and say, you saw something that I didn't see. Yeah. There is beauty in showing up the mundane that provides way for the miraculous. And his persevering and his endurance saved the life of so many. And so Mm -hmm. I know that there, we can look at biblical characters and be like, well, that was like so many years ago, or I'm not too sure that the Bible is real, or did that really happen? Well, let's put this in modern day context. Candace, who in your life, who's been a person that you have seen who's persevered in the face of persecution, who has had endurance when everyone would have been like, exit, I'm out, goodbye. Do you have someone in your life that's just been so faithful and enduring? 
I have several people and I can go in different directions. One person, because someone who's pace, faced persecution, but keeps persevering, I actually think of my brother a lot. Mm. My brother is Kirk Cameron, for those who don't know, but, mm. you know, he stands up for what he believes and he is persecuted and made mm. fun of by the press or whoever. And not all of them, not everyone, but he's been an example for me in my life mm. of how he's persevered. And in another direction, I really think of my husband, Val, mm. because he is one of the hardest working people I've ever witnessed in my life to see the consistency in his life. So for those of you who don't know, Val grew up playing hockey in Russia when he was three years old. And that was the system under communism that he was put in. So they choose what you're going to do. And mm. uh, he came from a family of Olympians. His father was an Olympian. His grandfather was an Olympian. And so he and his brother were trained in hockey. And then he left Russia at 17 because there was opportunity in North America for them to mm -hmm. make a career in hockey and make the NHL. And he did. And having been married to Val for 27 years now, and I was with him at the very beginning of his NHL career, I have seen the work and the effort he has put in every single day of his life. And it's not just during the season because everyone thinks, oh, of course you're playing, you're, that's when you're training and doing your best. I'm like, no, the consistency that my husband has had is always during the off season. It's when mm. no one else is watching. It's when everyone's taking their vacation and they get their four weeks or just a couple weeks before training camp starts, maybe they start exercising again. Or maybe when training camp starts, they start to get back into it. But I saw my husband take, you know, the, the three weeks for himself and then would start this, this training schedule that he and his dad and his brother have done every year. And it is like no other. Mm. And it's two times a day. It's every day. It's regimented with food and naps and eating and training and food and naps and eating and training. And the crazy thing is like other, they would always come into, my husband came into his hockey season every year, number one in shape. Come on. And because they, they test every year, they do like all these tests, put the whatever those things are on you, the little, the EKG the monitor EKG readers, monitors, yes, yes, and yes. they rate your heart, yeah. all this kind of stuff. And he would always come in number one in fitness. Mm. And other guys would, I'm totally bragging on my husband right now, which I love do it. it. Do I it. I love it. Other guys would say like, oh, we want to train with you and your brother and your dad <laughs> sometime. And guys during every summer would come and train. And I'm telling you, a lot of them only made it a week or two. <laughs> totally. They couldn't hang. They're like, whoa, we didn't realize you trained like this. Mm. But Val always did it. No matter how hard it was, no matter how he felt, it was like, this is what I do. I show up and I'm consistent. And he's been such a model for me in my life. And even though I'm not a professional athlete, mine doesn't come in a physical form, but he has helped model showing up yeah. every day. He's yeah. modeled that for me in my work as a mom. He's modeled that for our kids. Mm -hmm. And it's been invaluable. Hey, everyone. I'm so glad you're here. If you've been listening a while, you probably know my show is part of a larger podcast network called Access More. And I love being a part of Access More because it's not just any podcast network. It's an entire library of faith-based content from some of today's most inspiring faith leaders and speakers. Imagine a place where you can deep dive into meaningful, real conversations all centered around faith. Well, that's what Access More offers. The best part? Access More is a listener-funded nonprofit platform. This means that you can be a part of making meaningful conversations and reaching the hearts of millions. It's about creating a space to explore genuine and sometimes vulnerable topics, all grounded in faith. If you're interested in joining that mission, you can donate today at accessmore.com forward slash donate. And even if you're not in a place to donate, I encourage you to check out this library of content and discover new shows at accessmore.com. So we had a biblical reference and then we had a very practical reference. So I'm assuming that there might be someone listening right now, watching online that is saying, okay, well, how do I become that? Because 
you know, Val is an Olympian and he's a professional right. athlete, but he's also a normal person. And then there's like Noah. Well, do I have that perseverance? So let's talk, let's make this practical now. Okay. So um, in the research, I gave, a, I gave a hint to this in episode one about the three P's of resilience. I want to kind of flesh this out and tease this out so that everyone feels like, oh, this is how I build resilience. Uh, the first one is a healthy perspective, a healthy perspective. So based on science and research and data, um, there's a lot of uh, different understandings of how do we build resilience. But in from urban environments, um, from poverty to prestige, there is these key, uh, let's say, strands that come together in a braid that help build resilience a healthy perspective. Well, what is perspective? Perspective is an honest acceptance of reality while still maintaining hope. An mm. honest perspective of reality while still maintaining hope. So this is not the, I'm going to stick my head in the sand and I'm just going to pray the problems away and everything's going to be fine. No, no, no. That's delusion. That's mm -hmm. fake faith. There's people that are just like, just believe it and God's going to change it. No, okay. Wait, wait, wait. Right. I do believe God can change it, but let's just call it for what it is. Let's call a spade a spade. So um, let's say, uh, actually, let's put this into history. The prisoners of war out of Vietnam were uh, studied. And who are the ones that survived? The ones that uh, did not survive, that either had a mental breakdown or died in, in these prisoners of war camps, BOWs, were the ones that had a faulty sense of reality. We're going to get rescued next week. We're going to get rescued by Christmas. We're going to get rescued by Easter. The ones who survived were the ones that were like, we may not make it, but we're going to find a way to survive mm. every day like mm. it's our last day. Those were the ones that held so a healthy perspective. So they still had hope yep. within reality. reality. Yep. Okay, so for somebody great. out there, I'm not telling you to pretend that your situation doesn't stink. I'm not telling you to like just pretend it's okay or just positive confession or I'm going to manifest this. No, baby, let's be real. Okay. Yep. <laughs> the situation yep. is hard. But we can do we can do the hard while holding on to hope. So that's a healthy perspective. Okay. Number two is uh, this is a hallmark for gritty people is having a healthy ability to pivot. So a pivot is you're realizing you're doing the same thing repeatedly and it's not working. Resilient people look at that and say, "What way can I get around it? If I can't get up over, how can I get around? If I can't get around, how do I get through?" It's constantly assessing if this isn't working, how do I find solutions? Now, sometimes when people think about resilience, they think about people who uh, function at a loss, people in abject poverty. You got to get yourself up, the, the, got to get through your life with, by pulling your life straps up. What's that? Bootstraps. Yes. I got to get myself up by the bootstraps. Yep. Like that's great. And that does work for some people, but every person, whether in poverty or in a seat of privilege has the ability to pivot and say, I'm going to find a way out of this situation. And then lastly, it's purpose. So we see a lot of the work with Viktor Frankl. He was a Holocaust survivor in Auschwitz. And he was um, a psychologist who was studying who survived in these concentration mm -hmm. camps. And it was the people, I have a lump in my throat. Hold on, I'm not getting emotional. It's the people who have the ability to find purpose in their everyday. Mm. And so the survivors, so then he studied the survivors of Holocaust mm -hmm. camps. And those that found healing were the ones that somehow made sense of the pain. Wow. Somehow could look to Yahweh, to look to God mm -hmm. and to say, I'm going to find purpose in the pain. You can take this mess and make it into something beautiful. Those are the three characteristics of the most resilient people. So let's not use Holocaust survivors and POWs or biblical characters. Let's put this over the lens and filter of Val. So okay. Val's consistency in doing hard things on the ice but where do we see this play out like in your family? Because people think like, okay, I can be resilient at work, but I can't be resilient in relationships. That's not true. We can learn these attributes for ourselves and apply yeah. them to every facet of life. Yeah, it's so great. So with the consistency that he has modeled, it is allowed consistency in our parenting, in yeah. our everyday parenting, mm -hmm. because within the different ages that your children are at, you know, parenting changes. Mm -hmm in the way that you have to handle things, but yet we've been consistent in like 
the structure or the boundaries mm-hmm. or even the rules, I think, which is one of the most important things with children to have that. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it gets really hard. And I'm not talking about the little things, but of course, there are times where you're going to bend. You're going to say like, okay, today, sure, you can do this when maybe normally you, you wouldn't allow that. But I'm talking about like the big overall picture things like this is consistency and this is what we've made these rules for your benefit, for mm-hmm. your protection, mm-hmm. for your safety, because God wants us to, or because God says so. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that has played out, that has played out in big ways in, in our parenting, because I think it's easy when it gets really hard to just go, okay, fine, forget <laughs> it, just do it. I don't even care anymore. Even though you do. Yeah. But saying, nope, I'm going to, I'm going to hold my ground and this may be a painful decision for me to make as a parent to have to say no or, but I'm going to do it. And having someone shown that consistency in their life in other areas helps you build that and find the strength yourself. Did that make sense? No, it did. It did. And so this is your show. And I want to kind of flip the tables, if you will, a little bit. You are a very resilient person. So where in your life can you share with podcast listeners where you have found yourself in a position where you or God is shouting pivot? Like where in your life did you have to realize, okay, this isn't working and something needs to change? What was that? First of all, I can't hear the word pivot without thinking of David Schwimmer and friends and the couch. Pivot, pivot, (laughs) pivot. (laughs) Every time I say that, now that's what I'm going to hear. Thanks for I'm ruining sorry, my life. I did not mean to do that. But every time I hear it, it's like, let's make a meme for social media and we're going to put him. I know. <laughs> well, let's see. Well, I'm, I'm going to recall back to the top of this episode. Even I, we had to pivot on my engagement that's right. story. That's right. Really, we thought it was this great vacation. Then we were in the airport jail. (laughs) Talk about a reroute and a pivot through what that whole vacation was like, which, by the way, ended after five days because we we did. We got engaged and then we just went home. We spent like one extra day and then just. (laughs) (laughs) Pivot. Pivot. (laughs) Pivot. But I there's so many times in my life with. My husband playing hockey, we've moved to so many different cities because he's played for, I think, seven teams. But you don't know when you're going to get traded. You don't know if you're going to get traded. Mm. And that is, talk about a pivot because you get a phone call on the day that says, hi, you've been traded from Calgary to Florida Mm. and your plane's at five o'clock. So it's the day. And then I sit at home. I'm, I mean, I'm with the kids and I'm like, great. I don't get to go on Val's flight. Mm-hmm. The NHL doesn't do it like the Italian <laughs> police. <laughs> I guess they don't put the wives on that flight. So it's like, okay, I have to pivot. What am I going to do with the kids? Yeah. What are, how are we going to get there? When are we going to go? What Gosh. is the school situation mm-hmm. going to look like? And that happened numerous times in our life. I can think of pivoting in my, within my career because the whole basis of entertainment are pitch meetings. You're pitching creativity all Mm. day long. And when someone says, no, I don't like that idea. Great. Let me pivot. What are you looking for? Mm. Where, where do I take this? So I feel like my brain is the master of, of pivoting (laughs) in my life. Some are fun challenges, Mm. but some are really difficult circumstances that you just have to do it. You don't necessarily want to. So let's pivot and take a listener question. Great. We will take this first one. It is from Amy. And she says, I'm a 50-year-old woman who was just diagnosed with ADHD. I try to focus on reading the scripture and have a strong desire to get closer with God, but it's so hard to read and concentrate. And it's even harder to retain what I've read. Do you have any suggestions on how to get closer to God and read the Bible for anyone who has a hard time understanding and focusing? Okay. I don't have ADHD. Um, and, and Amy, I'm, I'm assuming that you've talked to your doctor and your doctor maybe at this point has given you some suggestions of and tools to use to help you concentrate. 
and and retain. But but even with a, as a person who doesn't have ADHD, I have a hard time <laughs> remembering and retaining what I've what I've read. Yes. But there are some practical tips that I have. One of them is actually coloring while you read the Bible. So there are coloring book devotionals or adult coloring books, even Bibles that have coloring journal space on it. But I believe that motion of coloring while you're concentrating, it uh, engages your brain differently. It Mm -hmm. actually calms your brain down because they use the coloring, adult coloring (laughs) books as um, in therapy as well Mm -hmm. to calm to calm your nerves or to just get you at a place that eases your stress level. So there's something to be said about that. But also, you don't have to read the Bible. You could listen to the Bible. Maybe mm-hmm. you want to try a Bible app mm-hmm. like version Bible app. That's what I use. Or I'm going to even suggest the Bible recap who uh, Tara Lee Cobble, Tara Lee Cobble my, yes. yeah, my season one co-host, and she talks you through the Bible and it's in smaller nuggets. Mm-hmm. Every single day. So hopefully that those might be helpful things. What do you, what do you think? You know, I want to, Amy, I get it. There's so many people that would just say, I just don't read the Bible because the Bible's boring or it's hard to retain. It's so not boring. <laughs> it's not boring. So this was like a game changer. <laughs> Two things that were a game changer. And I, I know that my lens and filter is a little bit different, but, uh, I would, I loved going to my grandmother's house and she would serve me a cup of coffee and we would sit there and watch her, her shows, which were Mm -hmm. her soap operas, but this is the Puerto Rican grandma. So all of the soap operas were in Spanish. We call them novelas. And any American will think of like days of our lives, uh, Mm -hmm. general hospital, one life to live, but in novelas, they're just extra crazy. I mean, they have 10 pounds (laughs) of makeup. Everyone's screaming. You find out that everyone is related. Somebody comes in, shoots Juanito. You find out that Juanito is her secret baby daddy. And then you're screaming. You're like, I can't believe it's happening. Right. That's the way I read the Bible. So people who are like, the Bible's boring. No, baby, you're boring. Cause the Bible is full (laughs) of mystery and intrigue, betrayal, murder, redemption resurrection. I'm just like, one, pray that you read the Bible like a Spanish soap opera. That, that'll that help. Okay. But then no also, kidding. sometimes we might need a different translation. Mm. So maybe the Bible, that, the, the version of your Bible that you're reading is like an older translation, like a King James with the these, the thous, and yep. the arts. Uh, what if you need the message? What if you need the passion translation or NIV or NLT? Find a version that speaks to you. And Graham Lotz says that Bible translations are like lipstick shades. You got to find the one that like, fits you best. So start with a good translation. Um, I loved your idea about re- listening to the Bible. I mean, mm-hmm. you version has, I mean, people even with posh British accents reading its translation, <laughs> you know, and like, so, the, so you can get someone to read it in a different yep. accent. You can get it in a different translation. I mean, there's so many other alternatives. And then lastly, sometimes I think we as Christians, we get very legalistic. Like I have to read a chapter. I got to read a book. Yeah. What if we like noshed? What if Mm. we just took like a verse and we just sat there and let the verse speak to us or we wrote it out or instead of reading like the, from Genesis to revelation, what if we just took a Psalm, one Psalm or one proverb, we just sat with it. What if we just wrote out that verse and said, spirit of God, speak to me. I don't, I don't want to be rushed. I don't want to make it like a thing or like a religious obligation. Like check that, check that box. I'm done. So to the listener, Amy, One, don't give up. Two, find creative ways. Three, break the system. And four, read your Bible like a novella. (laughs) So true. Anyone that says, I love, I love that explanation. I love it because I'm like, it is so not boring. It's not. I'm like, there's the craziest stories that even the most brilliant screenwriters couldn't even think of themselves. No, And AI only got it because it was already in the Bible first. Uh, Yes. Yes. Well said. (laughs) I love that. Okay. Well, I say it all the time. Life is like a roller coaster, but we believe that you can thrive, not just survive. We all need help and encouragement. So Bianca and I have something for you and you can get it at Candice.com. It's called What to Do in the Waiting and you will be able to download it for free. So go to Candice.com, find the link, and we'll also put that link in the show notes. Until next time, be grateful all day, every day. Hi there. 
If there was anything you just watched that was encouraging, hit the like button and comment below something that you learned in this video. Candy Rock Entertainment, all rights reserved.